Hey everybody, Joe Joseph here, and this is the DailySheeple.com's Daily News Brief. So, DailySheeple.com has a great piece that was written a couple days ago by one of my favorite bloggers, Brandon Smith. What is the real purpose behind this fake news propaganda that we see day after day after day? It's driving me mad. He says, the first problem with modern political discourse is that too many people want to win the arguments instead of actually getting to the greater truth of the matter. Discussions become brinkmanship. Opponents launch into immediate attacks instead of simply asking valid questions. They assert immediately that their position is the only valid position without verification. And when confronted with rational responses and ample evidence, they dismiss everything instead of pondering what you've handed them. After this line is crossed, of course, there's no point in continuing the debate. It'll just go on forever. This is one of the great tragedies of the Saul Alinsky method of political confrontation. It spread entire generations of people who now believe that there is no objective truth. They think everything is relative. Because of this belief, they assume that there's no wrong or right side, no wrong or right goal. Instead, there are only goals that are more right than goals of others. And their role, their, their goals are just, you know, it's, it's the... It's the I know what's best for you syndrome. It's my way is the right way and everybody else is wrong. We see it all the time. Everything, of course, in our society boils down, and you've heard it from everybody, especially when it comes to the presidential election, the lesser of two evils mentality. And the end, therefore, justifies the means, he writes, using dishonest measures to win the fight becomes acceptable. In the end, ideological combat actually prevents people from learning rather than helping them get to the root cause of the issue. We live in a world where truth is uh, superfluous to the overall narrative. The only thing that's important is destroying your rivals. It's uh, almost barbaric in a way. A classic strategy of dishonest debate and disinformation is to use every method possible to avoid confronting your ideological opponent's legitimate arguments and to attack him personally. Ah, that good old ad hominem attack. If you can't beat him on fair ground using reason and evidence, then why not undermine his character so that the public will be influenced to avoid listening to him at all? This is sometimes called inoculation. <laughs> at first glance, this is what the entire fake news meme supported by the mainstream media, seems to be all about. The mainstream media has proven itself utterly ineffective against the rise of alternative media. And if you go back and you look at Brandon's articles, you'll find out that he's written a, a lot on, the, on this in the past, this topic. See, the alternative media, he writes, is the closest thing to a free market of ideas that the world has had in a very long time, because think about it, really you've had the mainstream media had a, a monopoly over the information sharing because, you know, you had to go to a magazine or you had to go to a daily newspaper or you had to go to um, the television, but it was all controlled by media organizations. And then with the advent of the internet, you had the rise of citizen reporting and ultimately that spawned the alternative media which is basically citizen reporting. That's all it is. And just because it's citizens doing the job that the press is supposed to be doing, and that, of course, is providing that fourth estate that challenges the ruling power, that challenges Congress, that holds them to account. Well, because they're not doing it, Ultimately, what happens is the boss has to take over. It's the same thing that happens uh, at a job, right? If Joe Schmuckatelli isn't doing his job and you're his supervisor, well, him not doing his job, if you do nothing about it, is going to come down on you. Your supervisor is going to come down on you. So what happens? You have to get involved. You either have to fix the problem or get him out of there and replace him with somebody else. Well, this is the same thing that's going on with the mainstream media. People are pissed that they're not being told and given information that they can use and make logical, sound decisions for themselves and their family, or they don't feel like they're getting 
the truth when it comes to certain things. And so the alternative media has provided a different way for people to obtain that information, albeit they have to do their due diligence, just as you had to do with the mainstream media. You can't believe everything that you're told or heard there that you hear. I mean, if you do, then uh, that's stupid. You have to weigh everything on its merits. You have to do research to see what's true and what's not. You have to develop discernment. But once you do that, I mean, heck, you can tell what's fake news is what. It's your responsibility to ensure that you wade through it. The state can't protect you from fake news. They're the perpetrators of it. How can the perpetrators of it protect you from it? They can't. They can't. Now, he goes on to say the, of course, the alternative media has really cemented itself in. And it's this whole idea about the internet being a free market, a free market of ideas. It's been, we've been able to spread information uh, freely and quickly. And the result has been that the powers that shouldn't be can't, of course, get their plan through. He said before web media, the public was strictly limited to a handful of corporate outlets that dictated information and the flow of information with an iron fist. Just think about it. Since 2005, I think it's six people basically run the entire mainstream media. Six. So it's a very, very small group of people. If you wanted to learn anything about the mainstream narrative, you had to data mine at a library in an infinite an infinitely slower fashion. I mean, anybody that's my age or, or older, you can really understand, you know, you remember what having to do research at the college library and all that was all about. And then when we went back, you know, when I was doing like research papers, that's what you had to do. You had to go to the library. There was no internet. And then when you were done, you had a word processor or a typewriter. You typed it up, double spaced, you know, footnotes, that kind of thing. It's all different now that the internet has given the people the ability and the, the, the way to search knowledge that humanity's amassed faster than ever before. This has nothing to do with fake news. It has to do with advancement in technology. And unfortunately for the technocracy, it doesn't bode well because the peasants are becoming educated. So the idea is to keep them uneducated, dumb them down, keep them uninformed, and also make sure that you send them through the, uh, get the USDA stamp on their ass as they go through public school to make sure that they're thoroughly indoctrinated into how to become a good slave. Brandon says today data mining happens at light speed. Facts and evidence are uncovered in real time. Video interviews and transcripts can be archived as quickly as a phone call. They can be examined and witnessed uh, and witnesses can be cited without having to travel across the country. The prevalence, the prevalence of visual media also makes it difficult for witnesses to lie about their original claims later on down the road. And beyond this, the alternative media offers something the masses have rarely ever had choice. People can now look at all sides of an issue and all available evidence and decide for themselves what conclusions to make the most sense of the mainstream media has only ever offered one side. With highly regulated information and cherry-picked evidence, the mainstream media's purpose has never been to convey the unfettered news. Rather, their purpose has always been to manipulate public opinion. And of course, we saw this with the 2016 election when the WikiLeaks organization exposed journalists after journalists using their position of public trust as a weapon to influence the election's outcome. He writes, instead of admitting wrongdoing after this embarrassment, the mainstream media actually decided to double down and escalate the accusations that the alternative media is actually fake news, meaning the mainstream media wants people to believe that, you know, myself, Brandon, Melissa, you know, uh, all you out in the independent media, that you're fake news, that we're liars, that we're amateurs, that they're the actual professionals, and that the public should ignore everything that the alternative media has to say for now. And from now on, and he points out that though uh, the, the, the narrative of the mainstream news versus fake news seems a little thin. And really, what are they trying to do? The mainstream media is really trying to save themselves. That's what it's all about. 
He says, call me a conspiracy theorist, but the elite controlled mainstream media does little to help itself throughout this strategy. Think about it. The mainstream media is already dying. If one looks at the ever shrinking size of their audience and the loss of younger viewers and readers, they've been deteriorating for years while the alternative media has been exploding in influence. The promotion of the fake news meme requires the mainstream media outlets to actually list which sources they believe represent fake news. This is what um, the Washington Post did with the promotion of liberal professor Melissa Zimdar's list. So he says, forgive me if I'm making too much of a leap here, but it seems that this tactic will only bring more web traffic to sites that are on that list because the list doesn't really include any specific examples of fake news trespasses. People who are curious will be compelled to then visit the alternative sites to see what all the fuss is about. Perhaps many of them will find something that they like rather than something that they hate. To me, the entire setup of the fake news meme hurts the mainstream news more than it helps them. See, I agree with him there. I believe that that kind of logic, see, this is all based on the 1950s Red Scare McCarthyism stuff. Oh, the Russians did it. Oh, yeah, you know, it's fake news outlets powered by the Russians. It worked in the 50s. It's not going to work now because... There are too many people out there that write and blog about this stuff. And as there are so many different opinions on it, but the fact is, is that people are going and reading these things and becoming educated and seeing through it. And after so many times of being bamboozled, you know, you, there's only so many times you can do it before you finally get sick of it. And I think people are starting to get sick of it. He says the next major story linked to fake news has been the assertion by some in government, that alternative media, of course, is Russian hacking and propaganda and all that stuff. Now, he argued that a war is being engineered between Eastern and Western powers, Russia and China versus the U.S. and parts of Europe, That, and that this war will likely become an economic war. And it could very well become an economic war. I've been watching Oliver Stone's... Um, the Unwritten History of the United States or something like that. It's a series he's got on Netflix right now. And a very interesting time period to watch if you want to, like, single out and cherry pick a uh, part that I've seen so far is the, the years 1945 to 1950. It was right at the beginning of the Red Scare and why the Red Scare was actually brought about and what it actually meant because... All evidence pointed to the fact that the Soviets didn't want any problems. They didn't want any trouble. As a matter of fact, they were promised a lot of things that Truman reneged on after uh, Roosevelt put deals in place. And then the whole nuclear thing, that's another thing. The whole nuclear arms race had nothing to do with Russia pushing it. It had everything to do with America pushing this narrative. You know, all on this arrogant idea that we would have a nuclear monopoly for years to come, when in fact that was not the case at all. So, just a very interesting way of looking at it. He says the coming economic war will be based on a false paradigm, the false East-West paradigm. He says the evidence that Eastern nations are just as controlled by central banking elites and globalist interests as Western nations, including evidence that Vladimir Putin is an avid supporter of the IMF push for a single global currency system, using the special drawing rights basket as a bridge, he is also now suddenly a supporter of the UN's climate change and carbon taxation agenda. You know, you got to be careful about, and he says this, and I, I believe he's right, he says you got to be careful about cheerleading too much for Russia and Putin, not only because he's controlled opposition, but because eventually we would be caught up in a media war that would label us as enemy conspirators. Remaining rightly critical of Putin was the best way to avoid being labeled as a member of the fake news or a purveyor of Russian propaganda. He says, it's my only original, he says, it's my original belief that the elitist media would use the alternative media's love affair with Putin as a means to undermine our credibility. However, today, I would say that in a strange kind of way, the opposite's actually taking place. Confusing? Yes. Look at it this way. With the predominantly leftist mainstream media dying in an irreversible way, no amount of whining about fake news is going to save them. The rise of the populist is at hand, and this is all by design. 
Just as conservative anti-establishment movements are rising in geopolitical influence, so is the anti-establishment media. It's sort of a package deal. My belief is that conservative movements in the alternative media are being allowed into a position of cultural authority. The globalists are stepping out of the way for now, and we grow in power. They're doing this in preparation for a final stage of an economic collapse that's been gestating since 2008. And they're doing it because their goal is to set up us as scapegoats for a global disaster that will be remembered for centuries to come. Think about that. So, the calm before the storm, the lull. You know, if you take a look at things for what they are, it's true. The fake news meme will most certainly drive people towards independent media because independent media people who already read that stuff know it's BS. And people are inherently curious. They're going to look to see what this is all about. And who knows, a good bunch of them actually may end up staying because what we do write about in independent media and what we do blog about, you know, has merit. Our opinions all have merit. And now we're able to share them freely and openly in a domain that they have a very hard time censoring. They have to censor these individual sites, the ones that, you know, people aggregate everything on, like a Facebook or a YouTube. Those central sites there, that they're very, very difficult to maintain any sort of free and open dialogue. But out on the Internet, you, you can still do this. You can still do it. Yeah, I mean, they have their tricks up their sleeves with search engine results and things like that. But it's out there. And they can't just snuff it out. It's a problem. Activist Post also has a, uh, an article that the corporate media's fake news war is backfiring by showing the world the power of alternative media. Claire Burnish writes, As you likely have heard by now, Facebook's taken a war against fake news to a whole other level, employing third-party media and fact-checking organizations to judge whether news items are legitimate to the consternation of countless users who see the platform overstepping red lines. Serval corporate media immediately parroted the wealth of benefits that Facebook's plan will ostensibly provide from an alert and gateway system forced onto articles deemed disputed to the organizations making the kiss of death judgment call. Those being Snopes, factcheck.org, PolitiFact, and of course, the ever so accurate ABC News. Anyone with passing knowledge of bias in media is probably spitting out their coffee. All four organizations, of course, are notoriously left-leaning and liberal. And the list, of course, includes no outlets with any other of myriad, uh, any other of myriad ideological tilts. Indeed, right-leaning outlets from Breitbart to Drudge Report, as well as a sizable alternative media community who collectively held themselves to higher journalistic standards throughout the election cycle than old media titans like the New York Times and Washington Post, quickly condemned the, unbi the unbashed, unabashed bias imbued in Facebook plans. Of course, this is all about keeping that media monopoly intact, which is, uh, of course, it's not there. It's an illusion. They don't have it anymore. But they want to keep that illusion going. It's like the economy. You know, they want to keep the illusion going that it's actually, there's something to it. It's all fake. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all crap. It's unbelievable. You know, I hope people really do see this for what it is. And I hope it does drive people to alternative media in droves. But I can tell you that uh, as time goes on, things are going to get a lot worse. Uh, they're not going to allow um, the peasants to run the uh, run the show for a, for a while, and they'll pull the plug. They've got plenty of tools at their disposal. We're just in hurry up and wait mode. That's really all what it is, folks. Hurry up and wait. And so we anxiously hurry up and wait like we're supposed to. Ah, I'm Joe Joseph. This was the DailySheeple.com's Daily News Brief, and I'll have one again for you real soon. Subscribe to this YouTube channel today and check out our newsletter at thedailysheeple.com. Have a great night, everybody. God bless.